Good evening, everyone. My name is Neil Roberts, and I teach at Williams College. I teach Africana Studies, Political Theory, and the Philosophy of Religion. And I also have the honor of directing uh, the college's W. Ford Schumann 50 Program in Democratic Studies, uh, which is the program hosting today's uh, event, uh, which is nominally focused on uh, Professor James McAllister's new book, Wilsonian Visions, the Williamstown Institute of Politics and American Internationalism after the First World War. But as we'll all see, it'll also be an engagement, not just with the book, but with ideas through which the book uh, uh, generates and is generated. Our uh, initial speaker will be uh, Professor James McAllister, who is the Fred Green third century professor of political science at Williams College and the author of numerous works, uh, including a, a previous book entitled No Exit, America and the German Problem, 1943 to 1954. And I mentioned this as we were talking beforehand, which is that not just the Schumann program, but at the college, uh, we often uh, have uh, wonderful programming with scholars outside the institution uh, but we have less of an opportunity to actually be able to engage with ideas of our colleagues. And so uh, it brings me a great delight to be able to uh, have this with a colleague, a longtime colleague, and also learn from this uh, event. Um, but it will not just be one speaker, uh, we'll also be having two speakers uh, in dialogue. Uh, our second speaker will be uh, Professor John Milton Cooper, Jr. Uh, and I have two bios. I'm going to read the bio that was sent, and then I'll fill some things uh, in. Because <laughs> there was one that was sent, and I want to make sure to get that uh, uh, state that uh, directly. Uh, John Milton Cooper Jr. Uh, has spent um, uh, his career in uh, the Wilson World War I era. He's written several books uh, and many uh, essays. Uh, the last book uh, is a biography of Wilson, uh, which was a finalist, uh, one of two runners up for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, and our guest mentions that while uh, he does not have a direct connection per se with um, Williams College, except for some enjoyable visits, uh, for many years he enjoyed a friendship uh, with our uh, colleague, late colleague James McGregor Burns. Uh, our, he taught for five years at Wellesley, where he saw a New England college close up and then moved to Wisconsin where he taught at Madison for four decades. And so we really welcome, uh, welcome you uh, to our campus. Uh, but I'd be remiss if I also didn't mention that uh, his 2009 biography of Woodrow Wilson, um, in addition to being a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, uh, he's also a biographer of Patricia O'Toole, uh, the biographer Patricia O'Toole called him, quote, the world's greatest authority on Woodrow Wilson, <laughs> end quotation. So thank you, uh, thank you, thank you. Um, before we begin, I just wanted to go over some uh, mechanics for our session today. Um, uh, momentarily, we will uh, turn things over to Professor McAllister. Uh, but for those of you joining us uh, in real time, Right now, the live transcript is uh, active. If you wish to activate that either at your uh, computer, phone, or device. Also, we really welcome uh, questions um, during our question and answer period. Uh, we'll, uh, but also, if you wish to pose a question prior to that time, uh, you can um, input that in uh, the Q&A uh, feature. Uh, and we'll also uh, be able to take a raise of hands, uh, to whichever one is easier. So you can input questions either in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen or device uh, or raise hands. And hopefully we'll get to all of your questions. Um, and, uh, and finally, um, uh, after the conversation and questions, uh, we'll then wrap things up. And thank you all for joining. And let me turn it over to our uh, author to get things started. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I have to start uh, obviously with some, some important thanks. I wanna thank uh, Carrie and Steve for uh, everything they did to make this event possible. I particularly wanna thank uh, Neil, uh, he's absolutely right. Uh, we don't oftentimes uh, give a lot of venues to people at Williams College who uh, are producing works of scholarship. And I really wanna thank Neil for giving me this opportunity. Um, I want to say it, it's one of the, the greatest academic uh, privileges I've ever had in my career to have John Milton Cooper Jr. here. Um, 
it's both a, a privilege and, and quite frankly, uh, very scary. Uh, I would second uh, Patricia O'Toole uh, that John is absolutely without a doubt the greatest living authority on Woodrow Wilson, someone who has influenced uh, my thoughts uh, considerably. Um, I didn't write anything in this book without checking John's biography and, and a whole bunch of other things. And, and by the way, uh, you know, John, John knows so much about everything else around and surrounding Woodrow Wilson. Um, my book is uh, a kind of small part of, of uh, Woodrow Wilson. Um, uh, and, and the part that I, I want to talk about is, is the influence um, uh, that he had on, on Harry Garfield, whom we in Williamstown know as uh, the president of Williams College to the extent that, that we know our history. Um, but Woodrow Wilson absolutely changed um, his life in 1903. He sent him a letter saying, hey, would you consider joining me uh, on the faculty at Princeton? Um, not a lot of money in it, um, but you know what? Uh, life is about more than money. And uh, we're really gonna change the world here if you come here and we're looking for people like you. Um, Garfield, um, was in Williamstown on a vacation at the time. He spent two weeks agonizing over this question. And ultimately he said, hey, this is my destiny. And he, he gave up a very successful life uh, in Princeton that might've led in, uh, I'm sorry, in Cleveland that might've led in, in lots and lots of interesting directions. Um, I was originally gonna title this book, uh, The First Wilsonian. Um, I really thought that uh, Garfield is probably, you know, we often think about Woodrow Wilson in terms of Wilsonianism, which implies followers. Um, I, I'd like to make the case that Garfield was one of the first people who, who kind of followed Wilson um, and really followed him all the way to the end. Um, Garfield's life from 1903 until his death in 1942 uh, was really all about uh, Woodrow Wilson and, and his ideas. Now, I, I just say real quick, that you know, Garfield's an independent person. He's not a, a kind of subordinate in, in any way. And, and I'd love to talk about it with John because uh, I think there are a lot of questions about uh, Wilson and, and friendships and relationships and other things that are, are worth talking about. Um, but clearly um, uh, that is what Garfield did with, with the rest of his life, uh, both um, in how he ran Williams College, but most importantly, uh, the main subject of my book is setting up of uh, the Williamstown Institute of Politics, which um, I can't tell you how many distinguished historians and political scientists I've talked to over the years who are like, I have no idea what you're talking about. There is no importance to the Williamstown Institute of Politics. It played no great role in the interwar period. Um, and, and quite frankly, they're all, all dead wrong and it's not based on, on any kind of evidence. And, and, and I hope my book will, will end that uh, once and for all. Um, you know, uh, one of the great stories that I, I always like to tell about this book is um, I sent it to my, my dissertation advisor when I was done, a guy by the name of Bob Jervis, who just passed away a couple of months ago. Great, one of the great political scientists of um, you know, our time. And he said, James, you know, um, I got to be honest with you. Uh, I, I thought I knew everything about the history of the discipline of international relations. And I had no idea about this book and, and about the Institute of Politics. And that's interesting to me. And, and that was basically, you know, my kind of validation, like, hey, this is somebody who really knows something. And, and, and this is saying something new. Um, you know, I, I, I have a great respect for people who kind of, um, go over subjects that have been gone over a lot and lots of great work has done this one. I, I really think this book, um, it, it, it's not going over ground that, that a lot of people have uh, tread before. So um, I think the book has, has lots of flaws and limitations and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about some of them with John, but, um, but, but I do think it's, it's an original topic. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of leave it there, turn it over to, to John and, and see where things go. Thank you, James. Uh, first of all, I've got to say, uh, two of you now have said, call me the greatest authority or whatever on Wilson. Uh, uh, I've heard that one before. In fact, in, on two different occasions at public events, Anne-Marie Slaughter called me that. And the second time she did, <clears throat> I called her out. I said, "That's a, I've heard that before. And all I can say in response is to quote a president named Wilson, not Woodrow. Ronald, Ronald Wilson Reagan. 
there you go again. Anyway, um, James, as you know, I've, I've done a review of this book for H. Diplo, and uh, if it's not glowing, it's pretty close to it. I, I really, it's, it's very good. And you're right, it's very much a, a contribution uh, for something that had been overlooked and neglected. Uh, you know, you, you point out that two institutions, two bodies were, were formed 1920, I've got it right, 20, 2021. 21, okay. One was the Institute of Politics at Williamstown. The other was the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Now we still have the council with us today and we have that august uh, publication, Foreign Affairs. Uh, and they were both devoted to trying to keep America conscious of what was happening in the world and concerned. And they weren't all Wilsonian internationalists by any means and certainly at the council, but also to try to keep us, to make us play a really responsible role, a role commensurate with our size, our power, our wealth, and what we had just finished doing to ensure the Allied victory in World War I. Now the council, as you say, is still with us. Now it had some advantages. The principal one was its location. It was in New York City. And it, uh, as James points out, he draws some nice contrast there. The council, could draw on a lot of very, very deep pockets, uh, particularly among lawyers and financiers who were internationally minded. The council also, though, was from the very beginning utterly, unashamedly elitist and pretty much private. It, it's one public outreach for a long time was the journal Foreign Affairs. Other than that, it was very much these closed door uh, meetings of, uh, you could call them American mandarins of uh, foreign policy. And it, it continued there. Garfield had a very different idea. Oh, the, the other, the huge difference is that the council had several fathers. Uh, the IOP had one, Garfield. And James, as you know, in my review, I took you to task gently for not having Garfield right there in the subtitle because this was his. And I also said the book deserved a, uh, as a whole an epigraph, which was which is Emerson's, uh, Emerson's uh, statement in the American Scholar, an institution is the length and shadow of one man. Now that's gendered language of the 1830s, but it was. If there hadn't been Harry, if it hadn't been for Harry Garfield, there would have been no IOP. So that, that's sort of the biggest difference. The other difference was that Garfield was determined that this would be a public, would play a public role. And uh, I can't say that the, the, the people who attended the IOP were a cross section of the different economic strata or the different racial and ethnic groups in the United States or both genders. But for that time, I think Pretty much so. For one thing, women. I think the, the Council on Foreign Relations, I think it's, well, 10 years or more before there are any women participants there. Women were there from the very beginning. In fact, that was one of the criticisms of the uh, the scoffers was it, what is it, called it a, an old lady school teacher's? Uh, yes, yes. And, sewing circle. Uh, sewing circle, <laughs> which, oh, woo -hoo -hoo. well, you know, sexism. <laughs> yeah. So it was just a very different, very different kind of, of body. I think both of them played great roles in trying to keep the United States from retreating too much from an involved, uh, serious great power role in the world. Uh, the council persists, persisted, persisted, persists to this day. The IOP, uh, ended in 1932 because Garfield decided to pull the plug himself. Um, the notion, though, that it, it was just an ephemeral organization that nobody needs to pay attention to it, I think is a great mistake. 
because it really did. It, it kept international affairs, it kept the idea of an American role in the world very much in the public eye. It, it, really, it really generated lots and lots of publicity. Most of it favorable, not all, uh, but it did that. And to me, one of my hobby horses for many, many years has been in the 1930s, in the mid-1930s, as we all know, there was a huge upsurge of isolationism. And um, you could call it kind of uh, latter-day buyer's remorse about World War I, a great deal. In 1937, on the 20th anniversary of our intervention in World War I, uh, the Gallup poll, you know, uh, still in its infancy, but it's the first, Gallup and Roper were the first two to, to go in for real public opinion polling, which has really changed the way that we, we can write about the history of all kinds of public affairs, but especially foreign policy. They ask a question, do you think it had been a mistake to enter World War I? Now, granted, the question was, could have been phrased in a more sophisticated way, but the answer was 70% said, yes, it had been a mistake. Congress and Congress, they like to celebrate anniversaries. And here was the 20th anniversary. And guess who they honored? They honored the few senators and congressmen who were still there who had voted against going into World War I. I've often compared this to our virus remorse about Vietnam. I said, 20 years later, in 1984, the 20th anniversary of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, it would have been as if they had honored Wayne Morris and Ernest Greening, who were the only two members of the Senate. And I don't think there's anybody in the House. It was voice vote in the House. And I said, if, if American opinion had turned as much against Vietnam in the 1980s, let's say, as it did against World War I in the 1930s, Morris and Greening would have their statues in the Capitol. Well, they don't, it, it, was, it was very different. But then, to me, the fascinating, I, I don't think that's hard to explain. What I think is very difficult to explain, and nobody, I, certainly I haven't done it, has explained why did it, that tide recede so fast? You know, we're, we're fixated on what a tough time Franklin Roosevelt had nudging the United States toward our pro-allied policies, our aid, aid to Britain and so forth. I don't see it that way. I am impressed with how, how relatively easily he did it, that he, that he could do that. You know, what happened? Between 1937 and 1939, 1940, I think, I think organizations like the IOP, the council, planted seeds. There, there, I think there was, there was a residue, an undercurrent of that we needed to play a role in the world. We needed not only to defend our security, but also to defend our values. You know, that, that our way of life against what we would now call ideological enemies. And I, I think that was the, ultimately the, the greatest contribution of the IOP. Absolutely, um, and I'd like to talk about all those. I'd actually like to start, I think, with the, the contrast between the IOP and the Council on Foreign Relations that you started with, because I, I think it's really an important point. Um, you know, one of the great ironies is both organizations were virtually born on the same day. Uh, Garfield had his first opening meeting of the Institute of Politics on July 29th, 1921. That's the same day that the Council on Foreign Relations, which kind of had a murky kind of uh, relationship with other organizations, basically filed papers to establish itself as the organization um, it was. One of the, the, the great stories about uh, the Journal of Foreign Affairs, um, the, the leading speaker at that first session was uh, James Bryce, uh, the great British scholar. Um, he was driven up here by Hamilton Fish Armstrong, who became the editor of Foreign Affairs, who met Arch Archibald uh, Carey Coolidge, who um, was working with Garfield on the Institute of Politics, and they formed uh, basically the, the editorial team of Foreign Affairs uh, for the next six or seven years. Uh, Coolidge died uh, very early. You know, Garfield um, actually took his cue from Wilson on, on this one. Um, what needed to be changed were the attitudes of the average American uh, citizen, not, 
not already wealthy uh, financial elites uh, in Manhattan. And again, not that there's a problem with that. And Garfield did not have a problem with elites, but his argument was we, we need to cultivate a kind of public internationalism. Now, Garfield also had elitist elements too. Um, he wanted uh, State Department people and military officials and a whole bunch of other people to spend time in, in Williamstown, make connections with uh, European visitors and, and other visitors from around the world. But the, the key innovation that he had was to bring the press in to Williamstown. There was an AP reporter here, a UPI reporter here. The New York Times had, had someone stationed and a whole bunch of other papers. Um, and, and that's really what gave the, the IOP currency throughout, um, you know, if you, if you had, uh, you know, small town newspapers in Maine, they would read about the IOP. And, and I think it did kind of foster um, lots of, uh, uh, you know, it's always, as you say, it's hard to tell, you know, what kind of influence these things are having. But yeah, I think the, the result is clear when you look to the late 30s, early 40s, you know, there was an undercurrent of these things that I think eventually kind of kicked in. I, I think you're absolutely, um, absolutely right. Um, James, the other, the other thing, as you know, that I criticize you for, and you've got a very good answer for it, I want you, which I want you to give, is that, or the two things, I wish there'd been more about Garfield personally, his personal life. And the other was his relationship with Williams, especially apart from the, I, the IOP. And you, as you make very clear there, it was a strained or what, it, it's, it was not, not a, as warm and uncomplicated a relationship as you might think, that it was, uh, am I fair in, in saying that the trustees uh, tolerated the IOP and uh, were sometimes grudging in that? Don't, don't let me put words in your mouth there. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, one thing I think, you know, we want to go back to um, is, is Garfield and, and how he, he got to this position. There's, there's something that explains why Wilson kind of appealed to him so much in, in 1903. And the thing we always have to remember is uh, he watched his father, the president of the United States, um, get killed at a, a Washington, D.C. train station while all the whole family was about to come to Williams to celebrate their, their 25th um, reunion. You know, it, 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 it's not to make too much of this. And, um, you know, I, I had a lot more in the original drafts of my book about Garfield and his family. And um, as much as I love Cornell University Press, they said, hey, James, you, you're gonna have to cut back a lot of this. We want the focus to be on, on this element rather than those. And, and I understand that and we could, we could talk about it, but I, I'd love the opportunity to talk about it today. Um, look, a lot of Garfield's life is is how do I how do I vindicate my 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 own life and my own worth? Uh, I had a father who was a, a congressman, a, a, a civil war general, um, uh, you know, uh, an, an intellectual in, in many respects, uh, a really uh, powerful person who became kind of um, beloved because he was assassinated. He didn't have a chance to kind of disappoint anyone because he, he was only in office for, um, you know, three months. Um, and, and a lot of what Garfield is, is looking for in his life is uh, a, a real purpose. Um, and he, he could have been very wealthy. Um, he could have gone into um, politics. He could have been a uh, a court, he was a corporate lawyer. He certainly could have stayed in, in that field and, and accumulated wealth. Um, but I think his whole point was, um, that's, that's not why I was put on this earth. I, I, I will not be living up to the legacy of my father um, if I do that. Now, where it gets all interesting is um, his father was uh, obviously um, uh, a great lover of Williams College, but, but Garfield for a long time, uh, Garfield was offered the presidency of Williams in 1901. And he basically said, hey, um, you know, that's not for me. I, I have more to do in my life than kind of, you know, shepherd young, young men, you know, through, you know, their careers. I still have my own career to make. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, uh, without putting too fine a point on it, 
Um, Wilson convinced Garfield that the path to do that was through academia. But then Wilson, of course, goes into politics himself. And I think Garfield says to himself, and, and I don't think it's an accident that, that Wilson wins the presidency in 1912, and Garfield comes up with the idea of the Institute of Politics in 1913. And it's a direct kind of recognition that, that I need to do something that extends beyond the, the Purple Valley. I need to find some way of, of being, contributing to national and, and international affairs. And, and that's, I, I think a lot of how, how Garfield's family um, has a, a kind of big impact uh, on him. James, my, my sense in reading your book and having read some, not a lot, and I think it's very unfortunate of the really important people in the Wilson circle, as you point out, Garfield is the only one, yeah, the only one who doesn't have a biography and he deserves one. But what struck me was how much he was like Wilson, despite the differences in their background. Garfield is obviously Republican and unionist. Wilson is democratic and Confederate a little bit. So, but Wilson was never, just an academic, but yep. he, he didn't see himself that way. And then ivory tower is a later term, but he always wanted to have an impact. He always wanted to, uh, wanted to uh, affect and help shape public affairs. Um, his original ambition, in fact, had been to go into politics and basically decided he couldn't do that because he, he didn't have the independent wealth and the social standing to be able to get in at the top. Now you might say, well, there's a certain snobbery in that. Well, yeah, or perhaps there was. Although the, the person who did that, the other great figure, another great figure of this period was Theodore Roosevelt, who did have that kind of entree and got to the top very, very, very quickly. But the other thing though is what struck me and uh, tell me if I'm mis over reading this, my sense was that Garfield got roughed up in Ohio politics. Yes. And Ohio, Ohio, well, any of the big states had pretty rough political environments. Very, both parties were extremely faction ridden. And uh, the stab in the back was pretty common there. And my sense was that, that Garfield got himself roughed, roughed up in Ohio politics. And that made it that much less desirable to stay in Ohio. John, um, you know, you're, you're so right. Um, Garfield ran for one office in his entire life. Uh, he ran for the Board of, a, uh, Board of Education in the early 1890s. And uh, despite the fact that his father was president of the United States, long history of Ohio politics, um, he, it wasn't even a close race. The, the, the party endorsed uh, his Republican opponent. Um, he lost. He never ran for office um, again. <laughs> now, he... Um, the, the key to Ohio politics was uh, a guy by the name of Mark Hanna, who basically made William McKinley uh, president of the United States. Um, and Garfield and Hanna got along on, on some issues. Um, Garfield was a, a kind of moderate reformer. Uh, Hanna, you know, really cared a lot about his own kind of private economic interests, never trusted Garfield. A and you're right. Um, the reason why Garfield is so receptive to Wilson's letter in 1903 is um, there's about to be a mayoral race uh, for mayor of Cleveland, um, and Garfield is basically told by the Hanna people, yeah, we'll never ever support you on this. Um, and, and Garfield has a sense, you know, I, I, I've kind of hit uh, as far as I can go um, in, Cleveland polit uh, in Cleveland and Ohio politics, which, you know, uh, it's always fascinating to realize all of the political figures who come out of Ohio in the late 19th century, early 20th century. I mean, uh, Garfield, uh, very close with uh, McKinley, campaigned for him, had, had lunches, uh, very close. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was his political idol. Um, uh, William Howard Taft is, is from Cincinnati, runs across him all the time, obviously, uh, Wilson. Um, Harding, he's not close to, but Harding is also from Ohio. Um, everything is kind of uh, happening there. But by the way, the other point, John, I'm, I'm so glad you brought it up because it also brings up the issue of his family. Um, Garfield has, 
Garfield's brother, James, uh, is also a prominent Ohio politician who does get elected to the state Senate, uh, but is basically um, uh, runs afoul of the Hanna people and, and other people and um, becomes more involved in national politics through a kind of connection to Teddy Roosevelt that then leads him um, into uh, eventually becoming the Secretary of Interior. But Garfield clearly does not want to have the life uh, his brother has, which is running for statewide political office, losing. Um, it just was not in his, his personality. Um, now, his, his experience at Princeton, he's there when Wilson was transforming Princeton. Yes. He was changing Princeton from being a small, exclusive men's college into he did not, not open not, not opening to women that that's not till 1969 and not friendly to certainly not friendly to African Americans but uh, certainly to non-Protestant whites you know that that but but also transforming it into a university now Princeton at at its sesquicentennial in in 1896 had changed its name from the College yeah. of New Jersey to Princeton University. That was strictly, well, almost strictly symbolic. That it, it was, there was an empty shell there waiting to be filled. And Wilson was the guy who filled it. And he became the best known, best publicized, and I think in many ways the most dynamic university president in the country. And it's partly on the basis of that then that he gets, Wilson gets his entree into politics. But Garfield's experience at Princeton was with seeing Wilson trying to transform and succeeding up to a point and then running into some big failures in trying to transform this exclusive men's college, WASPy men's college, into something much, much, much greater. Uh, how much do you think that affected then his, his leadership, his presidency of Williams? It's a great question. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about Garfield's time at Princeton, and, and I've never been able to figure this out, um, what Garfield's expectations were in terms of scholarship. I mean, one of the things that, Wil that Wilson is trying to do at Princeton is raise academic standards and, and make it, you know, really, you know, the top flight university um, it became. You know, I'm not sure Garfield ever said, hey, this is a, a major project that I'm working on. You know, he had vague ideas about working on municipal reform, but nothing that any of us would recognize as a, a research program and agenda. It's not clear he, he published anything in his four years um, at Princeton. Um, nevertheless, he was still very close to Wilson because of um, his association, unlike uh, Jack Hibben, you know, a, a story you know uh, really well, uh, Garfield supported Wilson on all of his efforts to, to change uh, the kind of clubby elitist nature of, of Princeton in, in lots of ways. Um, and Wilson really, um, uh, you know, kind of said, hey, you know, you should think about becoming president of Williams. You know, it, it's hard to turn down but you know what? Um, you may, might not be so happy doing that. Um, you're going to run into lots of things that are, are are tough to bear. You could tell he was kind of projecting his own experience onto Garfield. But I, I think there was something to that. Garfield was not um, he was not a popular uh, president of Williams. Uh, he he basically came in and said, "Hey, I'm going to uh, I'm going to change this place in in lots of ways. I'm going to get rid of." all the kind of easy electives, people just can't take whatever they want to. And I'm gonna put pressure on what were called SNAP professors who, who basically um, taught without any kind of uh, requirements. Um, uh, Garfield had both student and faculty revolts his first three or four years at Williams. Now, the difference is, um, it was sort of understood that Garfield was was there as long as he wanted to be. No one was displacing him. His position was that um, that secure. One of the, the best uh, lines, um, uh, Wilson's first wife, um, Ellen, uh, actually said, uh, you know, 
uh, the, the, the people at Williams have treated Garfield a lot worse than the people at Princeton treated my husband, um, which is, is saying something, uh, yeah. Yeah. given uh, yeah. all the wounds that, that, uh, that Wilson uh, absorbed in, in his time there. Um, uh, you know, real quick, um, you know, as much as uh, I, I'm a fan of Garfield, uh, he was not a great president of, of Williams College in many ways for reasons that we can, we can talk about it. Um, he actually kind of understood the reason why. Uh, he was a kind of cold and distant personality. He wasn't, uh, he wasn't warm and cuddly. Um, and, you know, obviously undergraduates would have preferred someone who, who they could be closer to. He was much, much more of a kind of distant uh, figure. And, and he knew that um, in lots of ways. Well, interestingly, my sense also from, that I got from, from your book was that Garfield, even though he, with the IOP, he, he courted publicity and was glad for it, was not a self-promoter. And where that really struck me was during World War I, when he was the fuel administrator and Herbert Hoover was the food administrator. And to me, the major contrast was that Hoover, for all of his dour reputation and everything, loved promoting himself, absolutely loved promoting himself. I mean, his his picture was all over the place. You know, Herbert Hoover tells you meatless, wheatless and meatless days. And there's a, a picture of Herbert Hoover telling you to do that. And uh, and, and Hoover was, was indefatigable. I started to say shameless, that's probably a little too, too yeah. strong. But Garfield, on the other hand, as I, as I recall, stepped back from that. He, he, he did not want to promote himself and didn't. And I think in some ways uh, suffered for it. Am I right on that? You are absolutely right on that. Um, you know, one of the, the great things, as, as you know, um, but just real quick, Garfield uh, did one of the most controversial things ever done in American government in January of 1918, where he basically shut down all American industry east of the Mississippi. Um, and people are like, are you kidding me? What, are, what do you mean you're going to shut down all industry um, for a week? Now, um, Wilson's uh, press secretary, uh, Joseph uh, Tumulty, basically kind of spread it to the press. Hey, you know, Garfield's out on his own here. He, he did this without the knowledge of the president, which, which was totally false. Garfield and, and Newton Baker, uh, by the way, a friend from his Cleveland days, uh, talked to Wilson, said, hey, this is what we need to do if we're going to clear up the congestion of the port and everything else. Um, but, you know, Garfield never went out of his way to, to say, hey, wait a minute, I didn't do this. It was Woodrow Wilson. He basically took all the burdens on, on himself. Um, you know, John's absolutely right. Uh, he was not a self-promoter and, and really did not like being in the spotlight. It was just not uh, a role he was uh, naturally comfortable um, being. Um, now, he didn't, uh, it didn't bother him that people like Hoover were self-promoters. He got along well with Hoover. He got along with, well with Bernard Baruch, who was also uh, an incredible uh, self-promoter. Yes. And, and I think Wilson appreciated the fact that, you know what? This guy actually is in it for the right reasons. And it's not about where is this going to catapult me to some other um, realm? And I think that that mattered. Um, you know, there's a, a, a you know, the, the standard kind of line on Garfield, uh, by the way, much of what I wrote about Garfield's time at the fuel administration got cut because it, it was too long and lengthy, but um, that's another story for another day. Um, um, but um, I think that uh, Wilson, um, you know, in, in many ways said, hey, Garfield did exactly what I wanted to do, him to do. Um, by the way, it's, 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 I would like to make the case that Wilson shortly after this formed his, his so-called war council, which he brought together all of, you know, Hoover and Baruch and, and Garfield. Um, it's a pretty good evidence that that was either Garfield's idea or something that he and Hoover kind of worked out uh, together, which is uh, kind of important <laughs> in lots of ways. And remember, he's, he's, you know, still president of Williams College. He didn't quit. He, he just kind of went on leave for the, the duration, um, which is interesting. Well, Interestingly, I, something that occurred to me when I was thinking about our, our session, uh, in World War II, 
there was another president of a New England college who took leave to have a major position in the war effort. Uh, she was the president of Wellesley, Mildred, Mildred McAvee, who became the first head of the waves. Interesting. I, I taught at Wellesley before I went to Wisconsin. And uh, there's a wonderful picture of her escorting in 1943, Madame Jean Kai Shek on a visit to Wellesley. Now, Madame Jean Kai Shek was an alum, a Wellesley alum, but uh, very, very much there. So there, there, that happened happened other times too, that college presidents would take leave because they, they were visible figures and, and figures who commanded respect for their learning and, and their expertise. Uh, with Garfield, one thing, you mentioned Baker. Garfield and Baker became very controversial and were widely attacked. Yeah. Uh, there was even the Republicans and, and a couple of Democrats tried to uh, create a committee on the conduct of the war along the lines that the, the thing that the bedeviled Lincoln during during the Civil yep. War. And Wilson and, and Garfield and Baker and Josephus Daniels, the Secretary of the Navy, were the particular targets of this. And Wilson backed them to the hilt. He was, it was not one of these things where he uh, let them, uh, what, twist slow, slowly in the wind, in the wind. to quote President Nixon. Uh, no, no, he, he, he backed them up to the hilt. So, you know, lo loyalty went, went both ways. You know, John, one of the things that I, I wish I had more time to talk about in my book, but uh, I, I'd always love to get your sense on, on this because it's really an important moment. Um, and it's the, the great coal strike of the fall of 1919. Wilson, of course, has, has had a massive stroke. Um, and uh, Garfield is actually brought back. He has never, he never left his job as fuel administrator. You know, it was just kind of put in abeyance. Um, and Garfield gets right in the middle of uh, A. Mitchell Palmer and uh, uh, McAdoo uh, and you know, Wilson's uh, uh, both son-in-law, but also uh, Treasury Secretary and a whole bunch of other things. And, um, and John L. Lewis and John L. Lewis. Yes, yes, John L. Lewis. Um, really incredible stuff. He actually, and, and I'm not sure about this, I think he is the first person to actually um, resign in protest. Um, and uh, it's never been clear to me um, whether uh, Wilson was in any position in December of 1921, uh, in, in December of 1919 to, to deal with that or whether it's clear it was largely done through his second wife and, and everything. But um, it's a really interesting time that I've never ever been able to totally uh, figure out. But- um, Well, listen, you're, you're getting into one of the, one of the things now uh, uh, is, uh, was Edith Wilson an acting president of the United States? Because as you, as you said, yeah. Wilson had suffered this, uh, this massive stroke and was largely out of it. Basically, he, he's an invalid for the rest of his presidency and functions to some extent sometimes. We didn't have a full-time president after, after October, 1919. And how much did Edith Wilson become uh, an acting president. And of course, there was lots of talk there about, oh, yes, oh, it's terrible. We've got a woman president, government by petticoat, horror of horrors, all of that. And Edith was strictly, she said, I never made a decision. I never usurped anything. Well, as, as Hamlet says, the lady doth protest too much. Uh, yeah. She does admit in her autobiography, which has to be read very carefully and skeptically, that she did, she said, oh yeah, I, con I controlled who got to see the president, very few people, what matters come, came to his attention, not too many. And as I recall, I don't think she ever let him see anything about the coal strike. Uh, that that's just, that, uh, I, I don't know, I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to go back and, and dig, dig into that a bit. But the one thing that doesn't get asked there Assuming we had an acting president, somebody was going to fill in and do that, which I don't think we should have, but okay, that we did. How does she do? Well, actually, I think not too badly, because she knew his mind. She knew what he wanted better than anybody else did. And that was, they say that she put the interests of her husband and his health and recovery ahead of the interests of the nation. 
Well, there's some of that, but I, I don't, that was not, she yeah. believed, and I correctly, that she was doing what he wanted, that he wanted to stick with it and fight it out. And this is what, the, what they would do. So uh, I, I, I think, I think in the case of the coal strike, I'm not sure Wilson knew anything or very little about it. Yeah. I would agree with that. I, I would actually, I was actually going to take it in a somewhat different direction. I think Wilson would have disagreed with how Garfield had a kind of very hardline doctrinaire position that um, basically you couldn't allow basically corporations and unions to raise the price of coal on the American people. I think Wilson would have said, look, we, we need to get past this. We, we have far bigger problems. Um, and I actually think that Wilson's kind of incapacitation sort of saved their relationship. You know, as, as you know, Wilson has a tendency to cast people out into the darkness when um, they have a serious disagreement. Um, and he and Garfield, uh, from all intents and purposes, did not end their relationship badly or, or you know. Um, By the way, there's one thing that uh, you do have in there and I think needs to be emphasized is that uh, the connection with Garfield and with Williams uh, continued after Garfield went to the presidency when uh, Wilson's middle daughter, Jesse, married Francis Sayer. Francis Sayer was a Williams grad and was Garfield's assistant. He actually, he, how many years did he do that? Uh, four or five. Years? Yeah, four or five. Yeah. And William uh, Wilson regularly visited Williamstown and uh, yeah. uh, for family things. And he was in Williamstown when he got the news that indeed he had won re-election in 1916. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, by the way, John, I'm sure you're one of the, the few people on earth who has seen the 1944 movie, Wilson. Um, but it, yeah, uh, yeah I, I have. I don't know whether you remember the scene where they're singing by the light of the silvery moon and they're arguing about uh, Jesse's wedding and um, Wilson's other, um, uh, daughter who's getting married says, you know, well, you're the problem. You're marrying someone who lives at the end of nowhere. Um, that end of nowhere is is Williamstown. That's exactly what the, the reference is to. But uh, I think that was probably made up. Uh, in fact, <laughs> Nell, 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 you know, married, married McAdoo. And that's about six months or so after after Jesse married Francis Sayer. Um, my sense is that it, uh, Nell, Nell was the least serious and least least intellectual of the Wilson daughters, and she was uh, not not frivolous or flighty at all. But but you know that, and she actually <laughs> Nell was probably Wilson's favorite because she she could make him laugh. She was a cut up and could make him laugh and could appeal to that side of him. And uh, they were they were do antics and things like that, and that of course would shock Ms. Ellen, oh no, you don't, Woodrow, you don't do that, and so forth. But yeah, um, it, it, this was not, no, no. In a way, several times, Wilson said, you know, I think Williams may come closer to what I wanted to do at Princeton. He was, he, he left, it, it was, it was a, a very bad uh, break, uh, and, leaving of leaving of Princeton and uh, he was pretty disillusioned with Princeton and uh, what 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 Wilson was trying to do and what the, the still the eternal problem is how do you combine the advantages the intimacy of a small college with cutting edge research and the advancement of knowledge how do you combine the college with the university and that's what Wilson was trying to do at Princeton. And my sense, and correct me if I'm wrong, James, but I, I, my sense was that Garfield in a much less overt way wanted to do that at Williams too. I read the IOP, the founding of the IOP in 1913 as some kind of a move in that direction. And as you point out, the IOP of course played this great role in American attitude toward foreign affairs that was not its original purpose. It, no. it, it, some, something about international, but it was about much more about domestic affairs or things like that. Yeah, um, absolutely right, by the way, John, uh, John. He originally intended the IOP just to be a place where kind of great scholars could come to Williamstown. Um, mm -hmm. It was the war that transformed it into, we are only going to talk about international relations. 
and we're going to you know feature the voices of uh, people from abroad. One of the the, the great things, I, I can look out on, on Chapin Hall right from my office where uh, all these lectures took place. Garfield had one rule. The only people who could speak from the lecture stage uh, could not be American. They had to be from, from outside the country, which was kind of revolutionary when you think about it in the 1920s. And, and he received lots and lots of criticism uh, for that, that basic position. Um, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you love to have gone, participated in one or more of those IO, IOP sessions? I thought, what a what a what a wonderful way to spend part of a summer there. You know, it's a uh, yeah. intellectual summer camp that, that you've got there. Yeah, you know, John, um, we're probably not going to have time to get into it fully. You know, one of the problems is, you know, Garfield uh, subsidized the rates for people to come here. Um, he let in a lot of people who were not uh, as serious as students as they should have been, and who took advantage of the environment and the woods and um, it, it actually got him into trouble in, in some respect. He should have he should have thought differently about um, who had the privilege of being a member here. Uh, but after a while, he he'd let in a lot of people who who should not have been here, and that was something he he needed to exert a firmer discipline on. Well, the the other done. other thing, one other thing, I think we ought to mention was about Garfield and the the ultimate fate of the IOP was. Uh, he hated fundraising. He, hated by it. the way, he was he was absolutely at one with Wilson. Wilson hated it too. He regarded it as a form of begging. And uh, really, it was Raymond Fosdick, yep. with the Rockefeller Foundation. Fosdick, by the way, had been a student of Garfield's yep. at Princeton. Um, the Carnegie Carnegie Corporation and Bernard Baruch. Those were really those were the three. Were there any other funders of the IOP? Um, so he had one five thousand dollar contribution from Charles Crane, who was a kind of midwestern uh, kind of businessman. Um, one of the real problems, John, is Garfield was uh, prohibited from approaching anyone with a Williams connection for money for the institute, and this was spelled out to him in, in ultimate, uh, let there be no doubt about this. You cannot ask for any money for this. And Garfield's thought was always uh, along the lines of, well, you know, uh, Baruch will step up, uh, the Carnegie people will step up, the Rockefeller, how could they not? We're, we're doing such great things. And, and he really had no clue that, um, you know, Baruch uh, was doing it as a kind of favor to him, but that would wear off after time. And and he never really understood that neither Carnegie nor Rockefeller were going to wish to fund another endowment. That was their job. <laughs> to, um, it wasn't to set up another endowment for someone else. Um, he actually ran afoul, by the way, of Nicholas Murray Butler, the former president of Columbia, our, our alma mater for graduate purposes. Um, lots and lots of stories about that, but um, he messed up uh, on the money. And he also messed up by not asking for that money in uh, the middle of the 1920s rather than the late 1920s is when it became a, a serious problem for him. Neil, sorry to have, so, yeah, sorry to have to interrupt, but um, sure. this conversation has been fascinating, but we wanted to be able to give the audience an opportunity to be able to ask questions of you both. And so I wanted to remind uh, those in the audience, either who joined us initially or those who um, uh, joined us later, is that we welcome your questions now, um, both on uh, Professor McAllister's book, but also on the broader issues that have been discussed uh, thus far. And so in terms of asking questions, you can either pose a question within the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen of the device, or if you wish to raise hand, um, you can do that and we can call uh, on you in turn. Um, I do see that there actually is a question already in the Q&A feature, and so I'll read that out and then let our guests uh, get us started with this. So uh, the first question uh, by uh, Dennis O'Shea reads as follows. We know a lot more in recent years about Wilson's racism and his administration's reversal of the progress of Black civil servants in the federal bureaucracy. Did Harry Garfield ever run up against that issue and if so, what was his response? Yes. Um, so uh, obviously, uh, John can, can speak a lot more. Um, let me talk about Garfield's uh, role in this. Um, 
one of the best uh, letters in the Garfield papers is a letter from uh, an African-American from Philadelphia who said, hey, how can you defend uh, Woodrow Wilson? Um, you know, he's, he's done all the things that um, Dennis referred to in his question. And Garfield's kind of response was, well, you know, it, it's a little more complicated than that. Um, um, and, and Garfield always, uh, like Wilson, um, uh, was never comfortable with, 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 with issues of race. Now, for example, uh, African-Americans did come to Williams. Uh, Garfield, uh, one of his favorite students at Williams was a guy by the name of Rayford Logan, who would later go on to become a very prominent political scientist at, at Howard University. Um, Garfield had Booker T. Washington over to his home. Garfield was not um, racist, but he was not uh, vigilantly anti-racist uh, as well. One of the, the, the sorrier things that Garfield was actually um, employed during the 1916 campaign, um, Wilson was getting charged, you know, uh, some Democrats were saying, hey, uh, no, some, sorry, some Republicans were saying, hey, the Democrats are, are dominated by the old Confederacy. And Garfield actually made arguments like, hey, um, the Democrats should not be bringing up these kind of uh, sectional issues that only divide us as a country. Garfield was very much, a, hey, we're all in this together and, and I don't like thinking about class and, and race. Again, I'm not defending him on that position, but that was his position on everything. He didn't like ethnic appeals. He, he always thought um, kind of larger community, um, but yeah, he was not, uh, uh, he was not great on race. Uh, I think he was better than Wilson, but but that's not uh, something to talk about. But it's a more complicated subject. I'll turn it over to John. Uh, James, I think I think actually you were describing Wilson pretty well there too. Okay. Yeah, I think that's right. I in all of this, and I will not I will not try to defend Wilson Wilson on race as president. It it, it was bad, but. Wilson was, despite his Southern background, and I say despite his Southern background, was, he was much more like a Northern white of, of that time, like Garfield, who regarded race as, oh, a pesky distraction, a Southern problem, uh, something that would lend itself and approve with benign neglect uh, he, by the way, liked Booker T. Washington. Uh, Wilson invited Booker T. Washington to his That's inauguration right. as president of Princeton. Uh, Wilson was the first president to speak out against lynching in 1918, now late. And in some ways, uh, it's a statement, reminds me a bit of the Cold War that, you know, lynching and, and, and uh, the, these, this, this virulent racism makes us look bad in the world. You know, we're, we claim to be, as, as the, the writer to Garfield said, uh, uh, we claim to be fighting for democracy and, and so forth, when, when he should have said that this is condemned it more and more in, in strictly moral terms. But uh, Wilson, he was, I know it sounds like a cop out, but he, he was a man of his time. Uh, the difference between him and the white Southerners at that time is that for the white Southerners, with very, very few exceptions, race was an ever-present uh, concern, even obsession with them. And that's not, not just the demagogues, not just Tom Watson, not just James Vardaman, but members of his own cabinet. So they, there, there's this kind of always uh, antennae quivering for any any perceived threat to white supremacy, and frankly, there weren't many. Uh, whereas Wilson, you know, Wilson, oh, let's let's get get beyond it. Wilson did not like, by the way, his administration being characterized as Southern. He saw it as national. He, he yes. really, really did not like that. So Garfield in 1916 was uh, not only doing Wilson's bidding, but he was speaking Wilson's mind there. Yeah, by the way, Garfield believed that. He didn't want this kind of old, what he would consider old fights from the Civil War um, to be fought anymore. Um, yeah. And Garfield was like, hey, my, my dad fought. <laughs> my dad fought in the Civil War, was a radical Reconstructionist. You know, I think Garfield had a tendency, I'm not racist, 
um, but I, I'm not as militant in, in, in kind of changing wrongs, which again, I think is true for lots of people at this time. Um, yeah. Great question, very helpful responses. I mean, it is worth noting uh, that at the early 20th century in the field of international relations, you know, the flagship journal was initially focused on the idea of race, de race and development, right? This kind yes. of the question, the color line. And so this question is apropos, but I don't see any questions in the queue, um, but uh, I thought I could then ask a question to you both. And this is, um, take it much more uh, elementary because you all are kind of scholars of the, of the period, but just a very point blank. Why do more people not know about the Williamstown Institute of Politics? And I say this because it wasn't, it's having taught at the institution for several years, it wasn't until 2019, right before the pandemic, uh, the Schumann program partnered with the Caribbean Philosophical Association for a summer school. And one of the activities we had for the students, and these are students from advanced undergraduates to full professors who wanted more knowledge in the area, we did a activity with the college special collections. And so there was a huge table in the special collections and there were a couple of students from the University of Puerto Rico. And at a certain point, they came over to me and had this document. And I said, well, what is this? And it said it was the Williamstown Institute for Politics. And it had a ledger, and, and this is just my memory, but I believe it had a ledger that had themes for several years that had been decided. And they were drawn to it because the particular year that that document was, I believe it was in the 20s, was um, focused on the nature of the Caribbean. <laughs> and uh, and Puerto Rico was a part of the document. And so, I mean, that's a, a, another discussion, but this is all to say is that for myself, 2019, summer of 2019 was the first time, not only did I um, hear about it, and of course, then later finding out that James is writing this book, but also even just the documents. I've done special collections, you know, classes for years, and this was, that was the first time I'd even seen a document. So just at an elementary level for our kind of viewers, especially given, was it the 1921 date of having the Institute of Politics founded and then the Council of Foreign Relations founded. Yes, New York City has a draw, but it's not as if Williamstown didn't have a political cachet in the, in the national and global sphere. So can we just, just that basic question, um, why, why, why do more people not know about uh, this institute, which is separate from its longevity, just the kind of the nature of the institute yeah. itself? So it's a great question, Neil, um, and I would answer it this way. Um, People have a tendency to care about the past when it has a connection, a, a, a tangible connection to the present. Um, as, as John mentioned, the Institute of Politics died in 1932. It didn't have a, a kind of tangible legacy that you could look forward to. Also, the relationship between the Institute and the college was always a little fraught. Um, remember, this took place in the summertime. Williamstown, uh, Williams uh, undergraduates did not attend um, many uh, prominent trustees and alums thought that, that Garfield basically abdicated being president of Williams College to, to run this Institute of Politics. Um, the other factor, of course, is, is that Williams College is primarily um, kind of conservative Republican, um, not really uh, big believers in the League of Nations and disarmament and, and all these other things. And, and a lot of the more prominent alums, not all, and it was a kind of division, uh, kind of said, you know, this is not, not really something we want established with Williams College anymore. Um, um, by the way, I, I don't spend a lot of time on this in my book, but there are a lot of arguments that Garfield basically killed off the Institute of Politics because he realized that you really had to be both president of Williams College and chairman of the Institute of Politics and if he wasn't president of Williams College, it was not clear how the Institute could function. Um, you know, the other thing is, I think sometimes we're, we're, just, we're just bad on our own history. Um, and, and um, you know, I'm not a historian by nature. I, I, I'm a political scientist, which raises a whole nother question, um, but I have lots of good stories about that. I, I'll say one last thing the records of the Institute weren't really uh, fully cataloged and processed until, uh, you know, the kind of 2000s, which says an awful lot that they just kind of sat there for, you know, six or seven decades, but another story, but you're absolutely right. It, it's not uh, given the, the prominence and attention it, it should have been given. James, did Garfield himself do anything to keep, try to keep the memory of the Institute alive? 
You know, uh, John, um, he didn't. And, and the reason is, is after he left Williams, um, and, and I wish we could have talked about it more, he really wanted to write a great scholarly book on international relations. He, he did a year long tour of the Far East and, and he really thought that he was going to write this kind of fundamental text of, you know, um, how the world works. And, and I think he learned something very painful, which is I'm not really a scholar capable of writing that book. Um, the book he eventually did publish kind of came out posthumously after he died and um uh it, it's it's a it's a terrible terrible book he's just not um he, he was a great facilitator of other intellectuals he, he was not someone who could produce great intellectual scholarship on his own and i, I think he had to wrestle with that the last years of his life um you, you said when he left uh, the presidency of williams he moved to washington in other yes. words he, he left town he left town he was very involved with uh, the World uh, Peace Association. It was kind of based in, in Boston. Um, he used to have lunch with Cordell Hull all the time. He'd occasionally be with the president, just kind of keeping up and uh, you know visiting with, with friends and everything else. Um, but no, he, he led a kind of quieter, more reclusive life in the late 1930s. By the way, his position on the war is um, he really... Um, supported FDR and Hull for kind of standing up and uh, preparing America for war. Um, he, by the way, was always, um, you know, you, you brought up that great thing about uh, World War I. Um, Garfield was always torn about World War I as well. Um, he argued with Wilson up until the very end in terms of American entrance. And then basically, he had the same position Wilson did, which is the reason why we enter World War I is to change the world, to, to come up with a League of Nations, move towards all of this other stuff. Um, the actual origins of World War I, Garfield was, um, you know, he had questions about whether we should have fought the war uh, in that sense, largely because he, his argument is people threw away the, the path that Wilson had laid out for them. Um, I was interested that, um... As you point out, Garfield was in Germany when World yes. War I broke out and he helped, helped Americans get back, get back, get back home. Hoover, by the way, was in London and did, did the same thing. It was yes. how Hoover's public career got started. But yeah. Garfield, unusually for people from the Northeastern el elites, uh, was not, not pro-Allied, very different from Theodore Roosevelt, Henry Cabot Lodge, Henry Stimson, those people, that he uh, he could see both sides. Uh, he was, from having been in Germany, as you say, he was somewhat sympathetic to the Germans. So that 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 did make him different. That d definitely did, did make him different. You know, John, I, I think it, it's clearly something he got caught up in the moment. He was there, again, at the epicenter of, of World War I. He was in Munich. Um, and, and he just, uh, I think he got caught up in it. He bought all of the arguments about how we were attacked by, by Russia. Um, now, again, eventually he'd come out, he'd be very critical of, of Germany and everything else. But yeah, his initial impulse was, was no. Um, I, I found that interesting too, because he'd, um, he spent a year at Oxford, hadn't he? You know, in he very, had, very late 80s, late every, 1980s. Everything that uh, should have made him an Anglophile and pro-allied uh, he wasn't. I, I found that interesting about him. John, real quick, uh, he was an Anglophile, and he returned in the 1920s to being an Anglophile. Um, uh, British lecturers dominated the stage here. Um, and, you know, coming back to an issue Neil raised, I, I talk about it a lot in my book. Um, uh, the British spent a lot of time defending uh, their imperial role in India here. And <laughs> Uh, lots of bad moments. Garfield, by the way, Indian revolutionaries would also come here and, and Garfield clearly um, put the scale more on um, uh, British representatives. If you were a British liberal intellectual in the 1920s, you spent time in Williamstown, <laughs> without a doubt. And, and my, my sense too, James, was that the IOP did a pretty good job, but more than pretty good job of covering the world. In other words, 
They certainly paid a lot of attention to Asia. They paid a lot of attention to this hemisphere. Not so much to Africa, though. And, and I was struck that Africa tended to be the neglected part of the world there. But I was impressed that they weren't, you could say they were Eurocentric, but they were not yes. terribly, well, not as Eurocentric as a, as a lot of other, others were. Hey, by the way, the one footnote to that, John, Neil, I'll just tell the story. Uh, yeah. one's good. One of the great footnotes is, um, Garfield brought Raymond Leslie Buell here um, in the late 1920s, who had just written a famous expose of the Firestone Rubber Company in Liberia. Um, and basically, um, the State Department, Firestone, and everyone else were like, what is, the, what is happening here? Why are we you know, exposing all of this from the stage of Williamstown? It was a, a major uh, moment. Um, and again, that was kind of Garfield. He did not, um, he did not put his thumb on, on IOP events. A lot of times things happened here. Um, for example, Garfield was a big international law person, but all of the main critics of the kellogg brion Treaty actually appeared in Williamstown and made that argument from the stage. So um, he was open to alternative views, but that was the only time um, Africa was ever dealt with at the Institute. And it was actually very uh, embarrassing to the American government that, that this yeah. happened here. Yeah. So if I can interject, you know, we have probably time for a couple more questions from the audience, but there is uh, one of those questions is actually in the queue. And I think it actually um, complements where the conversation has just gone. Uh, so this is a question from Riley Farrell uh, that states the following. Could you elaborate on the types of speakers and members that attended the Institute of Politics? So in many regards, the types of speakers uh, and members, because perhaps that gets at also the subject area, areas discussed, areas perhaps not discussed, uh, who all was involved. Um, so maybe a window into uh, that question. Great. Um, so uh, as I said, um, basically to understand the IOP, you had two things. You had people who appeared on, on kind of the main stage in Chapin Hall, and then you had a whole bunch of other people who did kind of roundtable seminars, you know, what, what we would view as seminars. Those were always conducted by kind of American academics or, or other sorts of people. The people he had on the main stage were almost always people who, um, you know, were uh, members of parliament or involved with, you know, Chatham House in, in London, kind of academics who were not solely academic. Um, people like Lionel Curtis, uh, Philip Kerr, who later became the British ambassador to the United States. Um, he had Henry Wallace here twice for roundtables on agriculture and the world economy. Um, people like Charles Beard. Um, so um, part of the problem that Garfield ran into, and, and it was a problem that, that you can understand, um, uh, a kind of crucial moment in the Institute's history was uh, he invited Edward, Ed, Edward Benesh, who was the foreign minister of Czechoslovakia, who was supposed to come here in 1924. Um, and eventually Banesh said, you know, I'm sorry I accepted, but you know, I, I've, gotta, I've gotta go to the league, I've gotta go to other things. Part of the problem Garfield ran into is there are only so many people who are close to power who can come to Williamstown for four weeks and, and give lectures and then talk about things. Um, um, I'll give you one great example of someone who Garfield had here. Um, uh, a guy by the name of Count Carlos Sforza, who nobody here would, would remember. Uh, Sforza was one of the kind of main uh, opposition figures to Mussolini in Italy. He would eventually become Italy's foreign minister after the war, sign the NATO treaty, sign the European coal and steel community. Lots of these sorts of people who, whose names are forgotten today, but were very kind of important um, in their time. Um, one of, one of the great kind of curios here. Uh, uh, Charles Lindbergh was actually here for two days in, in 1930 uh, to talk about, you know, basically air policies and how aviation laws could, could fit in. It was that kind of place. Uh, lots of people, um, lots of people from the State Department, um, uh, military generals. Um, I, I have a lot of stuff in my book about the, the naval role um, here. Um, and, and Riley, you'll get to read all about this when I, I bring you a copy of my book to, to class tomorrow. So thanks. <laughs>
Um, I don't see any more questions in the queue, but um, since our, uh, we're near time, I thought this might be a good opportunity um, for, to pose to both of you. Is there anything that you wish to say either kind of James with regards to the book or and or, you know, John uh, regarding the kind of the Wilsonian era that um, that uh, that could leave us with and and I would of course encourage everyone to read the book but also read the different works of our uh, our speakers but really just any well, we won't call it conclusion but I thoughts that perhaps we could all uh, take away from today um yeah I'll, I'll give you one thought you know real quick um I think we should have an institute of politics at Williams today I, I think we do get caught up in a kind of purple bubble kind of situation and I think it would be great to um, learn from uh, people from <laughs> around the country, around the world, to talk about issues um, from a variety of perspectives. We could avoid some of the problems that, that Garfield ran into, but um, I, I, I think this idea of, uh, by the way, one of the things that Garfield had to deal with that we don't have to deal with today is uh, Garfield was running things on, on a shoestring. He had soft money pledged for a couple of years. Uh, we have a very big endowment. We could we could make this work financially in ways that that Garfield never could have dreamed of. So uh, that would be kind of my vision for the future. John, let me uh, let me <laughs> as an outsider let me just second what second what James said. Uh, I mentioned that I I taught at Wellesley for five years. Now, granted, that was a women's college, not a men's college. Uh, it was closer to Boston and not quite as remote. Uh, my wife went to Vassar, so that's kind of geographically more, more, more nearly comparable. But I was between the ages of 25 and 30 when I taught at, uh, taught at Wellesley. And uh, to be perfectly honest, I was in full scale young Turk mode and, uh, and I wasn't the only one. Um, and we would come up with ideas or complaints about things that weren't being done. And the answer we kept getting constantly was, we're a college, not a university. And I said, frankly, I said, I've learned to wince when I hear that, because I know the next thing I'm going to hear is an excuse for doing something that I think we ought to be doing. I, I think you mentioned the Purple Valley. I mean, that's for the small college, the idyllic uh, atmosphere, uh, the intimacy, uh, that's the danger, that, that's, that's the temptation. And, and no, you're, you're, not, you're not gonna be doing the same things they're doing at Harvard or Yale on cer in certain things. So the sciences, I think, are the particular problem there. But I think it's, I think it's always people at these, these kinds of institutions should be striving and doing their damnedest to keep those intellectual horizons broadened and not to, not to you know, come in on themselves, not to become ingrown. I'll say one thing about Woodrow Wilson. Uh, <laughs> well, two things. I hesitate to say this. Uh, well, no, I, maybe I don't because I'm talking to you folks at Williams. And as I mentioned, I was a friend of Jim Burns's and certainly he and you folks are the ones who really, really study leadership and presidential, presidential leadership. And I think, I think Wilson deserves a lot of study there. Uh, and he's our only professional academic, as you know, who became president. And uh, I think I've argued this and I've told I'm being too much of an apologist, but tough. Uh, I think there's certainly no career in US history. And I think I'd have to really scratch around very hard in other nations histories to find somebody, someone whose career vindicated the study of politics as a preparation for the practice of politics. It wasn't just that Wilson was a, a natural leader, which in fact he was and had a lot of gifts that way, who stumbled into politics and, and had a second career, which he did. But he, so much of what he did was to apply the insights, not just the specific lessons, that, that's a great, a, a great uh, sport used to be among uh, historians and political scientists was to, to try to square particular views that he had as an academic with then what he practiced. Yeah, you have that, but it's more 
an attitude and a, and a perspective on how politics works. And that, that's what he did. And I, I think that's something that he, for all of his sins and all of his flaws, I think something that he deserves to be honored for. One other thing, um, one of his favorite phrases, and he's got a quite few of them, memorable phrases, was safe for democracy. That comes from his war address, his speech asking the United States to, to go into the war. And it's, I think it's probably the most, one of the most misquoted things he ever said. He did not say, we must make the world safe for democracy. He said, the world must be made safe for democracy. Now, Woodrow Wilson was, maybe with the exception of Thomas Jefferson, the most punctilious stylist who ever occupied the White House. I can guarantee you he would not have used the passive voice if he hadn't meant to. Because there is, forgive the pun, a world of difference between we must and must be made. He didn't think we could do it, certainly not alone. Uh, what we could do is do our part, do our best, but ultimately it's the world must be made safe for democracy. And I think that's, this is a cliche perhaps, but I think that's the greatest problem that the world faces right now. I mean, and I'm talking about Ukraine. I think that is a, uh, a, a classic, absolutely classic test, test case for that. They mentioned Czechoslovakia. Frankly, as far as I'm concerned, this is a time not to, not to repeat the mistakes of Munich. And I know the Munich analogy is, is, is often poo-pooed and no, no, we have to think anew. Well, sometimes I think it's better to go back and uh, look at the past and, uh, and, and not, not make the same mistakes. I think that is the most apropos way for us to um, end today. I want to thank uh, Professors James McAllister, uh, John Milton Cooper Jr., uh, all of uh, those who are viewing um, re in real time. We hope to make this available through uh, the Williams College uh, YouTube page uh, for those who weren't able to join us, or if you were and wish to uh, to kind of uh, use uh, the video for educational purposes. And finally, uh, just to thank uh, the college and the uh, Schumann Program in Democratic Studies. We're delighted to have been able to host this, and hopefully it was uh, as enjoyable for you as it was for me. Thank you. Have uh, a good evening, and, um, uh, and thank you again for our, our speakers.